Okay, welcome to meeting 18 of the Mathematical Engineering of Deep Learning. So this is the third and final uh, practical, split practical that we're doing in the course uh, in parallel to us doing this practical in Julia. Now there's also a practical by Benoit Liquet and R and one by Shard Mocha using Python. So um, you can reach the content from uh, GitHub. You can download the notebook um, and let's do it. All right. So our focus here is on, is on getting uh, just some basic examples uh, happening with convolutional neural networks. But since we have a, a, a single dedicated participant online, we might even push a bit further. Let's see how much uh, we get together and um, how much we can push, push it together. All right. So we're, go we're gonna basically do a standard thing and uh, train a model based on CIFAR 10, uh, CIFAR 10. So um, here we use ML data sets and get uh, the training data and the testing data from um, CIFAR 10. So we see that there are 50,000 uh, images in the full training set. Um, one can call this also the full scene set, right? Because that training set, that scene set is gonna be split into training and validation. Uh, the class names in CIFAR 10, there are 10 classes, that's cross -mix. Um To make something that can run rather quickly in this practical, we'll consider uh, only three classes, not all 10. Uh, so the labels are zero to nine. Let's take label zero, three, and nine. So that is an airplane um, to a cat and a truck. Okay, so we'll take an airplane, a cat and a truck. So we, it, be, we'll go beyond binary classification. It's multi-class classification, but just, just let's just filter it just to have um, those three, simply because we want something that can run really quickly for a real time life practical on a computer that's not a, GPU-ish. All right, so the used labels are 0, 3, 9. And then this, this, is, uh, this is how you do the in function, right? So the in function in Julia is, is 5 in the collection 2, 34, 5, 2. Uh, the answer is true, is 7 in that collection. The answer is false, but you could also do it 7 slash in tab uh, 2, 34, Okay, just kind of a fancy way to write it. So uh, this is a collection of booleans then, right? Because it's true or false. So we're asking is why we're going, this is like going to be a train filter, is why we're going to look on the full training set. And we'll ask is why one of our desired labels, so labels which we desire to fit to zero through nine, um, and just do the same for the test. Okay, and the reason we do this is now we, we don't, we kind of make a smaller data set from the full train set. We go to something that has the name filter. There's a filter train X and the filter train Y. And it's basically going to be the original data set, which comes as a four tuple, but only sticking in this train filter here. So train filter is this collection of bullets. Okay, so train filter is. You know, a collection of booleans, we're only going to get the, the subset of these booleans, of which I would assume there should be around. Uh, so how many, how many, what's going to be the answer to this roughly? I think there's going to be 15,000. Is it, do you say there was 10 classes? And yeah. if there's 50,000 and we're using roughly 30% of it. Yeah. As you said, exactly. Okay. But not exactly. Oh, uh, <laughs> How, oh yeah, no, this is the full thing. Exactly, okay, you are fully correct. Exactly, this is kind of a fully balanced. All right, um, so then the length of the training set is 15,000 and the length of the testing set is 3,000. So we've just kind of thrown away the other labels, okay? <coughs> We're gonna even go a bit smaller, so we'll just train on 2,000. So out of these 50,000, we'll just train to 2,000. That's what we're doing in this cell. And we'll validate on 1,000. Okay, 
So the train range is this, and the validation range is going from 1,001 up to uh, 3,000. Okay, that's the validation range. All right. Um, now at this point, we, we still wanna still do something with the data. Well, we need to now convert it basically uh, to one hot batch data because the labels uh, should be one hot batch for uh, cross entropy based classification. Classification in general, it's kind of the thing to do. Um, so X train is just going to, this is just a renaming of the filtered uh, training set in the, on the training range. Uh, when I say it's a renaming, it's actually taking a splice out of that array. This is actually not uh, not doing a copy. That's an X train, and the X validate is that, and the X test is uh, just a testing set. And then we can apply one hot batch to the um, train range, validate range, and um, and uh, filter range where we're actually using the used labels. Used labels is again, just this kind of thing. We decided let's do it on class zero, three, and nine. Okay. But if, for example, we look at Y train, we should get a three by 2000 um, matrix of the labels where each column is available. All right, we still wanna break things into batches. Um, so what we're gonna do is we'll say, um, Let's take a batch size of 50. Uh, so how many, how many batches, how many mini batches are gonna be in an epoch with a batch size of 50? Is it 40? Because uh, there's 2000 exactly. in total in our training set. So each epoch will be 40 iterations. Mm -hmm. And then we'll take the, um, this we're iterating here over ranges these ranges are given by, so this type of thing. So the iterators uh, package is a built-in package, but I, we didn't do um, using uh, iterators. So um, I'm just using the namespace for iterators. And, and this gives you this, this, this type of object where you, know, you can now take its, its, its uh, third one. Uh, oh, sorry, maybe you can't do that, but you can iterate over it. So you can do, uh, say R in this, and it's an uh, R, so R in this. So it's an iteratable object where, you know, this is, it gives you kind of something you can iterate and each element is going to be a subset, okay? So you, you can't, it's not kind of random access, but you can iterate over it. And, and that creates, that's a way to create efficient, efficient partition. Okay, so each time R, R is like the range, the range in the iterators, and then we're gonna splice from X train a given range and similar to the Y train, and then gives us X train batches and Y train batches. So we're gonna do things a bit differently than how we did them uh, last week when we met uh, on the, where well, we didn't do convolutional neural networks, simply to, for some variety. So last week we used the, um, actually open that very quickly. Um, so if we go to unit, practical unit four. Um, last week we created the data for Flux. This is very Flux specific, what I'm saying, Flux.jl specific. And we put it in tuples of X and Y. And then the, the Flux train exclamation mark function assumed that the training set had tuples of X and Y of uh, features and labels. Um, now we're not gonna do this. We're gonna use just a slightly lower level uh, implementation. So we're not, we're, not, we're not gonna clump these X and Ys into, into tuples anymore. Okay, so you've got X train batches, Y train batches. Let's just, let's just look at the X train batches. Let's see, oops, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, just to see what it is. So it's an array of 40 elements where if we take say the first one, that's the first uh, mini batch. So the first mini batch is a week. It's a data chunk of uh, the image. Now it's a, the image has three channels and 50 images of that. Okay. All right. So let's now create a convolutional model, okay? Uh, so let's have a model that has two convolutional layers and batch normalization. 
and has max pooling and dropout and then so it's, it's a model that has quite a lot of things. all right so um we're just going to create this helper function that's called build build model so this build model one we, did, we didn't have to do this we could have just said model one equals that but that's that's sometimes common you create a helper function that creates a model um, so as we know in flux the standard way to do this a model is basically a sequence of functions that work on the proper dimension and convolutional layers in in flux they expect to get a four tensor okay you can't you can't put something that's not a four tensor or not in the standard way so again the four tensor is going to be the width the height the depth and the mini batch okay um it's kind of funny because then even when you go to production you still need to put things in a mini batch right but the mini batch in production will typically be one yeah that's really weird um <laughs> that seems yeah. weird that's yeah. that's just the way flux is designed i guess it, it might be a little complicated to have like two versions of every function one for a mini batch and one for not or to um like automatically detect whether or not it's a mini batch or whether it's a um like a three-dimensional image or is it three grayscale images so that makes sense I fully agree yeah at least the current version that, that's what it does but yeah and, and you know in production of course you, you won't work with a mini batch typically uh, well you might i guess you might uh still want to classify multiple things at, at once in some situations but yeah that, that, yeah, that, I guess that's true. So in general, in neural networks, right, you kind of you train in parallelism, and you know, you say if, if your neural networks are implemented in, in GPUs that work in parallel, yeah, you can do more parallel detections or classifications in parallel. Yeah, fully agree. Okay, what's that? Do you mind um, going just commenting on on the three arrow eight um, because I haven't seen that. Is that some kind of like association object in Julia? No. So yeah, so so if you do. Um, This thing is called a pair. It's just a a, an, a a type of thing that's called a pair. Okay, so it's not a it, it's not a um, it's not a, a an array. Clearly, it's not a tuple. It's a pair. Okay, it's a, and and it's it has syntactical uh, usage because it's just nice to see. And actually, I think when we worked last week, so this is last week's practical. And then we we got here towards the end of the practical to these um, to this dictionary. So a dictionary actually uses pairs. So let's see if we see this dictionary someplace. Um, okay, so we 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 created it this way. But one way to construct a dictionary in in uh, in Julia is to actually speak in terms of pairs. That makes sense. It, it actually, is yeah, tactically nice as well. Yeah, I kind of thought that Python, it should have like a, a, a concept of one of the things, one of the mapping things inside a dictionary, but it doesn't really have that concept. Uh, but this, is, this seems like it's just that concept. Mm, so see. that's cool. Yeah. And a pair is a, uh, well, I guess, I guess I, I should do this. So a super type of, of this pair is, is an M. Okay, so the, I thought it might be uh, inherited from a tuple, but it's not. it's not. So you can do, you can do, by the way, you know, you can do the super type of, of uh, in 64, it will be assigned, and the super type of assigned will be an int. And you could do uh, subtypes of um, float of real, um, these are the reals, etc. So there, there is a, there is a basic type hierarchy. Um, <clears throat> All right. So the first thing we put is a convolutional layer. Okay. So where this first tuple says these are three by three convolutions, this is from three channels to eight channels. Uh, we didn't have any freedom of choice about this three, but this is now a model design choice. Uh, we put the activation function built in the convolutional layer. Let's do actually padding and let's uh, do the default stride. So we could have avoided the stride. <laughs> Let's look at the at the conf constructor. Um, oh, that's not. Oh, maybe I didn't do uh, using flux. Here. Okay, so the filter, this pair, um, the default of the activation function would be the identity. The way uh, to do initialization. This is different in, in, in default initialization. 
I guess tried we could have put a one. Oh, okay, so we can put either a tuple or a single number. It would be most commonly actually a single number, padding zero. Dilation, um, we didn't speak much about dilation, but dilation is this other factor where you take your convolutional filter and you actually expand it out. So it actually has folds in the middle. All right, so, so that's the, the first convolution. And, and let's actually, let's just think what's, uh, and then we're doing batch normalization of A. So the way batch normalization works is batch normalization is trained normalization for the everything that's in this layer. If this layer would be a dense layer, then we have two trained parameters, a scale and a shift parameter that are trained to what to do with this layer. Uh, and the standard way of doing batch normalization when you have a convolutional layer is one trained parameter per channel, or sorry, one trained pair per channel. Okay, so, so there, how many trained parameters are here in this layer? And in the batch norm layer, it's, it's layer from the software perspective sense. Well, you said there was eight channels right. so and two per eight. channel. So how many trained parameters? So each batch normalization is not a single parameter, but rather two. two. So 16. Exactly. And just for the fun, how many trained parameters are here? <laughs> uh, I'm not taking the class for credit, so I don't have to be able to do <laughs> these quickly. But, um, but that's a three by three filter um, taking three um, input channels and eight output channels. Does that mean it's three by three by three by eight? Okay, no, so that's that's good. Okay, so at least at least there is something here. So that so the the number of input channels um, does not. Uh, yes, no, actually you're fully right. Yes, three by three by three by. Eight. Sorry, I, I was going to tell you something wrong. You're fully right. Yes, because you're doing a three by three convolutions on a depth of three. So exactly. Okay, so you're not doing the class for credit, which is good. Okay, neither am I actually. So we're, we're <laughs> all right. Um, and let, let's do still for the both of us, what is the uh, going to be the size, the number of neurons that we have at the output of this max pooling. Um, so what we're going to have is, um, so we're going to have the, um, the input dimension, which is 32, uh, plus twice the padding, so twice times one minus the size of the uh, convolutional uh, filter divided by the scrolling plus one, right? So this is, this is what we should have. So that should be 34 minus three, which is 31, 32. So it kept it at 32. And after max pooling, it should be at the size of 60. Now we could have coded this without keeping in mind that this is exactly 16. Uh, but at some point when we get down here to this number, 196, we have to uh, we have to actually move. So we have another convolutional layer, which takes us from eight channels to four channels. This time there's no padding, so there'll be a bit of a decrease. Uh, so oh, so the, the 16, which we just calculated up here, um, is, is what we have down here, okay? Um, and then another max pooling, and it turns out this is 196 neurons. So then there's a dropout layer associated with this. Again, not a layer, but dropout associated with this dense thing, a dropout associated with this. Uh, and this final thing here, this dense is, is a is linear activation followed by softmax because the softmax op operates on this three-dimensional layer. Okay, so that's model one. So to debug the model, let's not train anything, but let's just take a single sample image. And, you know, as, you and me just had this conversation of well, what do we do with a sample image, right? I mean, let's let's assume this model is already trained at the moment it has just junk parameters. Well, the parameters are that were initialized using this type of uh, uh, glow, root, uh, glow root uniform initialization. Um, but here's a sample image, okay? So we still need to think the sample image still needs to be a four tensor, even though the fourth element is, is, is one, okay? So this is a sample image. Okay, so we would plot this would just look like uh, like like noise. Let's apply the model to the sample image. The model is a function. And um, so here Flux is telling us, hey, we have some uh, type inconsistencies, uh, but let's let's not get to this level. So 
So because there's, we're, we're changing between these eight bit representations and flow 32s, there's some inconsistency. So ideally to make this correct and fast, and certainly if we're, we're actually gonna do something serious, we'll, we'll have to make sure that everything is uint eight um, or we go to un 16. Um, so that's just a warning, let's, let's leave that. Do you even do your floating point math in um, normed integers or would you go to floating point? Um, so I, I don't know actually, I don't know what's best practice. So I, I think I would, I would look at this and I would, I, I'm not familiar with GPU programming, but I would probably say, let's go to float 32 or a float type because the, um, the operations like multiplication and stuff might be faster, I, but I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah, me neither. I, I know that, that there's a good practice in doing 16 bit actually, right? Okay. So, and that's not flow 32. So actually I think working just with uh, unsigned ints is, is becoming a standard, but that's, that's really something I, I, I don't have expertise on. Maybe there's some, um, maybe there's some assumptions on like the range of the, the values that you're typically working with, because I imagine that um, it's actually pretty probably easy to, um, to keep a lid on most of the, um, most of the numbers as they flow through the neural network, because you've got all of the normalization and the um, activation functions happening straight after you do any kind of multiplication. Um, so maybe maybe because they've got like a certain range, it makes sense to use a normed integer. Yeah, you want to make sure that things don't saturate, uh, as you say, that things don't, don't grow and kind of out of the range. The batch normalization would take care of that in general. Uh, but yeah, I, I actually don't have enough practical hands-on experience to tell you what's, what's best practice. Um, okay, so so we, we had the model here uh, and kind of unexpectedly on white noise, we actually got equal probabilities roughly for the labels. Do you think that's unexpected? Wouldn't, I mean, my, I, I think it would be unexpected if- Oh, sorry, expectedly. <laughs> yeah. Expectedly. Yes, if expectedly, for sure. Spot on. Yeah, so I mean, that's right. So we're, we're not, and Im the image is not pulling us in any direction. White noise image, white noise um, uh, neurons untrained. Well done. All right, and then we've got the length of the model. Uh, so we wrote this little function here, debug model. Um, so let's see what this function does. So before we, we do it, let's actually just let's just let's just do it manually. You know, as it's, as, as I have a feeling that you've done a lot, right? So if, if you want to write a function, just kind of play with it scripting wise beforehand. So let's take model one and let's just take the, um, the first uh, layer of model one. So that's this convolutional layer. So I can apply this layer on the sample image. Okay. And here is what we get after the first layer. It's kind of nice. We see we get a 32 by 32 by eight. Okay, because we've had eight channels as eight filters. Um, and then, you know, we can, we can then maybe apply the second layer. So, so to do that, what we can do is just take the first two layers. Okay, so the first two layers, if we do that, um, it, did, it did now uh, the batch normalization, right? So the second part of the model is a batch normalization. Um, and if we now apply the first three layers, then we should get max pooling and this thing should half. So the size is half from 32 to 16 to 16. So basically, let's just do this now slightly more automatically. So um, top layer is gonna be the index of the top layer. It's gonna run from one to the length of the model, which I believe is 13. And we'll print the after the, the output after top layer layers. That's just printing the top layers as dollar inside the string. Uh, we should print it out. For this to work, uh, when I did this, we actually have to uh, need to flush standard output uh, because of uh, race between uh, print and display. I, I don't know the, the exact details of why, but but there's, you know, so if, if we don't do this then things won't print sequentially. Uh, so this is the standard output, we just kind of, the, the minute this line is called, we want it to be uh, printed here. It might be a Jupyter thing. It might be that outside of Jupyter it works well. 
Um, so then uh, we apply model one onto the sample image, but let's just collect its size and then let's display its size. That's it. Um, I mean, we could have printed the size, I think, before kind of did the display of the whole model. Uh, so when we run this, we, we get this kind of sequence of after one layer, you've got 32 by eight, you know, you've got this and you've done the max pooling. Then you've got your second convolution, which didn't have padding, second convolution. From here to here, you've got max pooling. And now you've got seven times seven times four, that's 49 times four, that's 196, that's 196. Okay. And then we go to 80 and 40 and one, et cetera. Uh, of course, if we would change the model and say, we don't want 196, we want 200 here, everything would seem to work here. Uh, but once we do this debug model, at this point, it says, hey, I'm trying to multiply 80 and 200 by 196 and one. So there's a dimension mismatch. Okay, so that's kind of this, this idea. Do you think it's worth, um, so, so Flux, I don't know if these parameters, they seem like they're um, required, um, but it's like, that's a choice, right? I mean, you could, you could make this a part of the library that you just specify the output size or like the convolution in a convolutional case of each layer. And it, it'll figure out what the input size has to be because it just looks at the previous layer in the chain. Um, do, so do you think it's worth um, sort of at, like from a software perspective, um, forcing the developer to be conscious about these sizes and actually having to uh, systematically or maybe manually even go through and calculate what the sizes should be? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I, I don't know the, you know, there's not a clear answer. I mean, the, the flux is, is in the sense of kind of a low level library, really. Um, I don't know the state of the art of the wrappers around flux. Uh, so one could, one can kind of think of like a, a say a Keresi wrapper around Flux, for example. I mean, there's wrappers in Julia for uh, around TensorFlow, for example, right? And uh, and I, I even I think for PyTorch, but they're not not as popular because not they're not Julian, right? But the, it might it might, might might be wrong to do something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. it's, it's things are still in the Julia ecosystem are not fully developed in terms of machine learning. Uh, First thing, but yeah, and I, I don't know. If, I mean, we, we saw the metal head wrapper, right? Um, that's one I kind of like, because that's really kind of you plug out of the box, but that's a complete wrapper. That's not for training. That's just for using a, a network. Um, yeah, that's all I know. Um, okay, so task one, modify the model to have uh, five by five convolutions. Um, do you want to do this? Uh, you, you're our, uh, our student. <laughs> I might pass because I uh, haven't uh, compiled the notebook yet, um, no. but I can, we can see that it would be, uh, I mean, it's easy with flux because you just have to go back to the build model function and, and change the numbers in the, in the tuples for the convolutions. And yeah. it also said to remove a max pooling layer or something or add a max pooling layer, but that's just as simple as adding mm -hmm. another entry in the list. Yeah, exactly. So not, not a whole lot to do. I mean, yeah, five, five by five in the first layer. Uh, the thing to do is to do some accounting, right? So, yes. um, but what we can do is we can do um, we can do this, and then we can cheat. We can do this, and then this thing is going to break. And then we found out that the magic number is 144. Okay, which we can of course calculate, but uh, in this case, so so if we change this to 144, this thing works. Okay, so that was fast, as you said. So we All made right. the convolution bigger. The the final size went down because of the because we didn't change the padding. Is that right? So like that second layer was now like the border uh, moved in because we made the convolution bigger in the first layer. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a perfect observation for this, right? Mm -hmm. So the the natural padding with this uh, bigger convolution would be a padding of two. Okay, so you're adding from three to five, you add two more, yeah. So if, if we were to make your padding of two, this would, this would now break, but it should be back to 196, exactly. Back in the lecture, you were talking about the um, inception model, um, running multiple of these sizes of convolutions um, at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, 
that what you just did there with the five and the three and changing the padding is that what you were talking about with the inception or they no, similar to no. that what what inception would do it would this requires just a bit more coding uh it, it would in a single layer it would now create a say a tuple or a concatenated array of three different types of operations okay so um just, just Let's just do it just to, just to kind of see how this thing is. So let's see, uh, build broken because it's not going to be a full, a full thing. Okay. So, so say I'm here in this first layer. Okay. I can say I want a five by five convolution, but I also want maybe a, a three by three convolution. Okay, say with padding. Now, if I want to put these things together, and let me, I'm, I'm just going to comment all these other guys. Okay, it's going to be broken. We won't do this to completion. Okay, so what, what I can do is I can say, let's make like a, an anonymous function. So an anonymous function is, is like, yeah, here's a function x going to x squared. This is a function. Let's apply this function onto uh, the number seven. Man. Okay, so I've defined this function like that. Of course, I, I could. I can also define a function else. But uh, let's call this function. Let's call it. It gets a previous layer. It gets a tensor from the previous layer, and it returns something like a tuple of the convolution applied to the previous layer, and this other convolution applied to the previous layer. Let's see and. This closing the tuple and this comma closes this thing. So this is so now the first layer is like two separate channels. Well, I don't want to say channels, but two, two separate streams. Okay, it's two separate streams of, of computation. Um missing something, maybe uh, maybe this, but then this is not this. So let's see the second. Oh, that's right. Convolution applied to prev. I think this should be okay. So hold on, let, let's see. So, so this applied, if I just take a convolution and apply to sample image. Yeah, that can work. Okay, so I can do this. So this is this first convolution. Oh, I think it's still another closing here on my own. So chain of Prev goes to this, returns us a tuple. Okay, I don't see what's, oh, I don't know what I did wrong before. Uh, I think you just added a one more parenthesis and that fixed it. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, so, okay, but we don't know how to do the size. Uh, so let's not, let's not do, we don't know how to do the size of a tuple. Uh, but let's let's just let's just apply model three to sample image. Yeah, uh, so you've got this this tuple out, um, and yeah. it has it has like the two outputs from the functions. I guess what you what you might do is you you might make this just like a sixteen channel output. So you mm -hmm. have two eight channel outputs, um, and if you did the if you like did the concatenation in the right way, I'm sure it would, I'm sure it would all go through. Exactly, um, but. Um, but I'm interested because for this to work, for this to be like a 16 channel in, uh, output, you have to kind of have the same shape in the rest of the, um, like the, the other dimensions have to have the same shape for the eight from the five by five convolution and the eight channels from the three by three convolution. Oh, but the, the so you change the padding. Shape. Yeah, that so, you change the padding because uh, otherwise they wouldn't have the same shape. That makes sense. For um, sure, yeah. So is that right. is that the trick that uh, inception? That's what, happen, that's what happens in inception. Yeah. So so playing around with padding so the outputs are the same, spot on, right? And then still running through and doing one-dimensional convolutions to reduce dimension. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So in in principle, is this type of thing? But as you say, yeah, this tuple you'd want to concatenate in the right way, and, and it's doable. Okay. Great, yeah, I said. 
Okay, so now we get to uh, flux. So uh, let's do the cross entropy is going to be cross entropy. This is x and y applies model to x and y. Um, and here's like the loss. We haven't trained anything yet, but of the first x and the first y with the model, uh, and we get some. Okay. And here's the uh, here's the loss on the all the training data. So th these things work in batches because that's how they are. Um, okay, and the accuracy um, pretty much the same. Uh, just the things one call checking. Them. Um, sorry, is that is that loss? Is that um, is like an average over the batch? Because um, we ended up with one or just over one. So that I mean, cross entropy is and is in units of bits. Um, but we have fifty images. It doesn't make sense to me if there's one. Yeah, bit. but it, oh, it runs on average. Yeah. So okay. The, the cross entropy, the flux. Yeah. Okay. So the cross entropy. Um, um, as in one other completing it. Um, so the the flux cross entropy does an average. Okay. Um, just AGG. I'm not sure what AGG is. Just some kind of aggregate, but like a an expectation is an aggregate. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has a default epsilon, etc., and it asks the epsilon of that type. Right. So, so, so. You give it some type, it's going to ask what's the standard epsilon for. Oh, cool. That's nice. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it tries to be generic, right? And it pretty much is. Right? So that's, uh, and these are all uh, vectored operations. Of course. Yeah. The epsilon is so that we don't have underflow in the log. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Just not to take log of zero. Right. Okay. Um, accuracy uses one called, similarly to last time. Last time, I mean the previous last week when we met. Um, and here's something which I don't think we did per se last week. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're just we're going to compute gradients. I'll say quote unquote manually. By that I mean we we, we call the automatic differentiation uh, for backward model automatic differentiation. So the way to use gradient is you apply it. You give it here. Um, you want the gradient of this thing. Uh, but it's going to be, it's like a function of nothing, okay? Because it's, it's the training data is fixed and the, well, you're going to give it some X and Y, which is fixed. You're going to give it model one. Okay. So you want to compute the gradient of this thing with respect to these parameters. So that's, that's doing automatic differentiation of um, everything that's in the params of model. So the flux params function takes a model and kind of pulls out anything that's trainable in there. Okay, that's marked as trainable. Uh, and it's, this is your total loss. That's amazing. I, I really like that. Like auto diff seems like a really amazing idea to me. And I really like this line of code. Um, yeah. You've got that parameters thing too. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's like returning a reference or something, but it's somehow returning some, um, some way of, uh, of keeping track of which parameters or which variables the um, the implementation of the auto diff is going to have to like work with respect to, and it's all done. I know it's all compiled, but it's like it's all done. Like that's all figured out at compile time or whatever in the function. So that's awesome. Yeah, exactly. So so here here it's it's so so yeah. So so it goes kind of in, in not in the runtime uh, of of this, but this kind of uses exactly as you said. In compile time, so yeah, you can try this. I mean, I've I've used this gradient on on you know completely different things uh, without any context to uh, deep without any uh, deep learning context, and it it, it works. Uh, so the whole concept of differentiable programming, etc. Again, we have some uh, warning because of the types, but let's ignore it for our purpose. So we're going to use, in a sense, the uh, lower level flux. Um, step, which is update exclamation mark. Okay, so the way update works is, is you're giving it an, an optimizer. Um, that optimizer is just going to return to you the, um, the, the, the difference all the time, but it has a state. Okay, so the update function is very simple. It just, you give it an optimizer and it's going to update the param parameters plus equals optimizer. 
return value. Okay, so the, the optimizer should have a, a call, hey, what do I update? Your optimizer is gonna be Adam, but you could have had here RMS prop or, or gradient descent or, you know, which is a simpler one. And, but uh, anyway, you could have any, any of the optimizers here, any of the optimizers from Flux optimizers. Um, yeah, you know, just basic momentum, et cetera, et cetera. But Adam has become the standard. Um, and you're just going to update the parameters of model one, uh, the gradient. So of course, this doesn't have a return value. I mean, it gets a reference to the parameters of model one. Model one is now changed, okay, based on the gradient. So every time I do, I run this, uh, we'll control, control enter and this is, this is if somebody's doing, I'm doing control enters here. This is deep learning uh, menu. Um, okay, but I haven't changed the batches. So this is just uh, for now, at least with respect to the first mini batch. Okay, so the training loop, we can now just code the, the training loop. So we'll do a, create a function like train models. Let's use the built-in dates package just to show some time. Um, let's run for 20 epochs by default. Again, parameters after the semicolon are kind of main parameters. Uh, let's have a learning rate of zero point, whatever this, stick that to an atom optimizer run for 20 epochs. And for each epoch, let's loop on the mini batch index, BI stands for batch index in this case. And we compute the gradient. To compute the gradient, compute the, the uh, batches on the batches and do an update. Um, we can then, in every epoch, compute the accuracy on the validate set with respect to the current model. Let's also compute the loss with respect to the training set. Keep the time, change it, change now to some nice format we like, and then just show as a debug print of the epoch, the time, the accuracy, and the loss, and return the model. Um, so train model on build model one. So build model one creates for us an, a brand new fresh model one, um, puts it on the heap, uh, right? So it's, and um, what do we see here? Epoch time accuracy. So this is accuracy. I think we're gonna reach here an accuracy of around 80% or, or something like this. Keep in mind, this is, this is now training color image classification on three classes from a very small data set, 2000 images uh, and validating on another thousand. Um, yeah, so that's that. Um, you see the loss decrease and uh, that's it. Okay, of course there's much better ways to do this, uh, but this is kind of a rough, rough quick way. We've trained our first convolutional um, you, we can then, we'll let this finish in a second and then we'll run this. So this will just test on the model, the X test, Y test in the whole model. We've got 76% accuracy here. Um, and if we test it, we test it, um, we've got 75% accuracy. That's it. Um, Okay, so the second task would be to create a different model architecture of your choice and, and try to play around with this. Um, but let's not do this in the in the five minutes we have with the one dedicated good student in class. Thanks for coming, by the way. Um, otherwise, it would be very awkward. I mean, not impossible, but awkward. Um, let's start to do something that uh, just, it's a start of an experiment and uh, you can continue it yourself uh, or just, at least think how you'd continue it yourself, uh, et cetera. So let's, let's do a bit of a localization experiment. Um, so our, our course didn't focus on it, but I'll, I'll just go back to it very quickly. So in the lecture, which was yesterday, um, we finished with the, the most basic localization um, in classification example. So when we say object localization, we typically mean localization classification. So we have an object in a bigger space. 
and we want to return the x, y, w, h and say what class it is. Okay, or say it's nothing. And one way we can encode this is via such a tuple where we say here, what's the probability of there being object or not? It's location and bounding box dimensions and one hot encoding on the class. In this case, two classes, bird or plane or something like that. Okay. If there's nothing, the training data would have this where these are don't care. Otherwise the training data would have these and say a one on the current class. As always, when we do probably, and, and, and a very primitive basic loss function just does this. If, if there's no, nothing, you just do this. Otherwise you do that. So let's, let's actually just, we're not gonna get uh, all the way to training, but let's see how we would do this with, with, with data and just a bit of data augmentation. So in the lecture that just follows, Benoit in Tricks of the Trade will also speak about data augmentation. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do is we'll take the MNIST data set and we'll, we'll create our own data set for localization. Okay, so um, one way to do this is let's, uh, let's assume that we're gonna go to a dimension say, MNIST is 28 by 28. Let's put it in a range of 100 by 100. These are digits flying in the sky, okay? Um, so we're, we'll have an image of 100 by 100 and we'll choose some random top left corner for this actual image. Our assumption here is that the, this five, or maybe it would have been you know, this, uh, this other digit, um, this nine takes the full image. It doesn't really but let's just assume it does. And we could, have, we could have kind of thrown away a bit more. And the second assumption is, let's just assume that these things are 28 by 28. Okay, so let's just for the simple example, let's not stretch uh, or, or, or shrink the image. But so then we'll take X and Y will be some random point between 172, 172, because that's kind of as the top left corner, you know, 100 minus 28 is 72. That's as much as we can go. And then we'll stamp our, our, our image from X to X plus 27, Y, Y 27, throw that image on there. So just put it in a random location. So here we're, we're, we're putting kind of the first image. Um, this is going to be the first MNIST image, which is a five, it's, it's taking it a bit, is going to um, appear in some random spot, an X, Y spot. Um, so the plan is let's now just do this for all of MNIST, or at least some big enough, uh, okay, we'll do it to a thousand here. This is for one for a bit. And each time we'll also create the labels. Okay. So while this is running, this is just gonna create an image which you kind of saw, but let, let's do it. So we'll go for a thousand images. Our data will be a uh, hundred by a hundred by one by, um, a thousand, okay, that's the total data. So we're, we're treating it as, okay, so it's kind of, there's, there's kind of a five in a, in a random place okay. to run fast. Um, and here it is in the same place, and here it is in a different place, etc. Okay, and if we would have taken the 45th image, we would have got the three different places. So we're gonna, we're gonna create this. So what we're gonna do is, is this is the data, the Y data, let's think, it'll have 13, uh, it'll be vectors of size 13. So Y size 13, this is very, this is not wonderful code, but that's just to get the idea. So the first one is PC, the probability of is there something or not. The next one is X or Y, X and Y. The 28 by 28, we, is, is, we don't learn, we assume 28 by 28 for this exercise, and then 10 classes. So one hot 10 classes, okay? So we run over the data and each time we, we create an image, oh, sorry, we don't even need this. Um, we, we get random um, coordinates for the X and Y. Let's just fix the C, this fixes the C. Okay, so this, this is repeatable. Um, and then what's this probability? This is probability of, of having an image. Okay, so, so with probability 80%, have some image, otherwise maybe not, because we, we also want to say there's no image. Uh, so if there's an image, let's stamp the image onto this XY location. Let's put for PC, this is PC and label, yes image, 
let's record the X and the Y. And then this is, takes the encoding zero to nine and shifts it and puts a one half vector. Okay. Um, and what is this? Uh, it might be too easy if you, um, if you don't have any noise. Yeah, uh, yeah, some noise. Okay. Um, it might still be too easy. I mean, that uh, is only going to be a maximum value of 20% grayscale in anywhere where there's not an image. If you see a 21% you know, yeah. grayscale, then the, the network can just like use ReLU to like corner that part and, and definitely know that that's where it is. Yeah, I fully agree. And even, you know, you could, like, if you knew this was data, you could hand code some things, right? Uh, but, but, you know, sure, uh, it's, it's a start. It's just, it's just an example. Yeah, yeah. Fully agree with you. Uh, so then this is, you know, this is uh, the first image. Uh, there was nothing. This is the second image. There's oh, that's coming out because that's not normalized. Uh, or, yeah. No, it is normalized. So that's why it looks like it's white, but it's actually just like zoomed in on the darkness in the background. I think it's a function of heat map. That's what's happening. Yeah, yeah. So a heat map will just be like going from zero to twenty percent, and it'll make twenty percent like really yeah. bright. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So, and if we look at the labels, um, then take the label um, y data one. The first label is nothing. Uh, there was nothing. Second one is still nothing. Third one had a four. So if we go to the third one, you've got with probability one, there's something in the label. These are the coordinates 67 and 43 of this top left corner, 67 and 43. And zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Um, okay. So the at, at this point, what what you would do is you would build a localization model and feel free to continue this or at least conceptually continue this. The point is this, lo this localization model at the end is not just going to give you, uh, it's going to give you something that looks like this, right? So it's going to get uh, this perhaps from a sigmoid onto the dense, okay? And although we can also do it as a function of, of kind of the softmax, so there are multiple ways. It's going to get two numbers that are the X and Y. So it's like a regression model. And then it's going to get these labels from a softmax. Um, so that's something to do. Yeah, that's this is where, where we stop. Um, so this is like the localization model on a sample image. And the task is to finish off this localization example. It, it takes a bit more work. At least something like this can be, can be done. I had just one question about that uh, final layer, the output, um, mm -hmm. with respect to the the positional information. So the the uh, component uh, two and three, uh, the x and y coordinates. Um, so did, did, we're treating this like a regression task, um, and we're not putting any activation on those. Um, so we're allowing, I guess, the full real line to be our predictions. But in this case, we actually have a bounded range for our output. Um, because it could be between zero and 70 uh, yeah. or, or whatever. Um, do you, so do you have any comments on like, when, when does it make sense to use um, regression versus um, something like uh, we put this through a logistic function and then multiply it by a 72 or something like that, we'd get, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we get something else. But I don't know, it's not, it's not clear no, that it's... that's what we should do because maybe there's, there's no more, no less likely that we would be like right at the end of our range than it is that we'd be like right in the middle. And so you do want something kind of linear. No, I, I, th I think you, I think you're fully, right. I mean, the point's fully right. Uh, I don't know what's best practice and one, one needs to experiment, right? So, I mean, first of all, even if there is best practice statistically, but still if you're taking such a model and then putting it in production, if you have some chance of getting that, that something will put you out of the box. No, you want to saturate it. Yeah. One kind of, you know, take the uh, maximum was zero and the minimum was 72, you know. Um, you, uh, this is a trick that I learned. You can you can just take the median of zero, 72, and the number, and that will give you a clamped value. Oh, well, that's kind of nice. I mean, I mean not, not necessarily the most computationally efficient if you look at this, but that's kind of nice. Yeah, very nice. Okay, so you're saying, yeah, 
So so at least at least mathematically, if you yeah, want it's to like a min trick, but with one option, yeah. Nice, nice. Okay, very nice. Okay, so so yeah, I mean, I, I think we can put something like that. I, the sky is the limit in the output layer. That's maybe the sensible one. Um, if to put nonlinearity, I'm not sure. So I mean, th th this type of localization has anyway been you know super kind of in improved later by by much bigger things. Uh, so the detection problem and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what best practice is. But perfectly tiny gamma. I haven't looked at these literatures, uh, th these literature, but I guess you can also play with the coordinate system. Like, there's no reason we necessarily have to be using x and y. Uh, we could maybe use like from a from any reference point, we could use like an angle and like a um, an arc length or something like that. Um, there's very many different ways to like identify a region in, in space. Um, with what, so you, yeah, I guess picking you you could maybe pick a coordinate system that um, is su more suitable for um, the sort of output of the network. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, heaps. That was really interesting. Do you have more or more thoughts? And uh, no, no more questions. No. Okay, let, let me pause the recording just after we say bye. So first of all, bye and thank you. I'll, I'll pause the recording a sec. So see you, everybody. Uh, one sec.